You are listening to Gangland Wire, hosted by former Kansas City Police Intelligence Unit Detective Gary Jenkins. Well, good evening, all you wiretappers out there. Back here in the Gangland Wire studios, I've got a kind of an interesting story here. A guy that one of the fans asked if I would take a look at him, and he is an interesting guy. He has the greatest nickname of all, Nick the Blade, Eugene Jeswal, G-E-S-U-A-L-E. He was a notorious capo in the Genovese crime family, and he was the infamous Pittsburgh Connect in the movie Goodfellas. Now, before we get into this, don't forget, hit me up on Venmo once in a while. If you don't mind, buy me a shot and a beer. If you want to do a little more, you can hit me up on my website and donate on the donate page. You get a reward for doing that. You also get invited to my almost monthly, but not every month, Zoom call with podcast supporters. We either get a guest or we just have a topic and we talk about what we're interested in in the the history of the mob. So now, when you think of the Italian mafia, uh, we usually think of New York with the five families. As everybody knows by now, especially since 1957, Appalachian, upstate New York, they're all over the United States. And particularly the East Coast hubs, uh, you know, Cleveland, Philadelphia, and Pittsburgh, Western Pennsylvania has their own, like Springfield has their own active kind of a subset uh, family. Uh, A lot of young Sicilian immigrants got into bootlegging back in the day, and mainly they're connected to the Genovese crime family, it seems to me like. They seem to really have their fingers out into a lot more outside of New York City in that kind of eastern zone all the way to Cleveland. Running drugs, gambling, loan sharking, infiltrating labor unions in Pittsburgh. The usual kind of crimes. Now, this one particular guy, Eugene Nick the Blade Jeswally. He was one of the area's most influential and high-profile mobsters with a name like Nick the Blade, man. You know he's high-profile. He was an infamous figure. He was known as a gangster's gangster. Old-school mafioso made his bones in the early 1960s. He got into drugs. He probably kind of kept that on the down low from the national level. As long as he was making money for people, they don't really care. comes down to it. And and he got into the drugs when they really got profitable in the 1980s. He'd spent almost 30 years in the penitentiary over his lifetime, primarily for his prohibition time-related crimes. He was a player in the Pittsburgh mob for several decades. He even got, as I mentioned earlier in Goodfellas, he was was known as the Pittsburgh Connect. Eventually, Nick the Blade and the rest of the Pittsburgh Mafia will be rendered obsolete, just like all the rest of them have basically all over the United States because of RICO and wiretaps and uh, hidden microphones and, and draconian sentences. I tell you what, when you start giving people that are 65, 68, 70 years old, sentences of 30, 40, 50 years, they know that's life in prison. And that'll turn you, man. That will turn you. Even those hardcore guys, it'll turn them. Doesn't turn everybody, but it turned a lot of them. Let's go back and look at our friend Nick the Blade's early life. Of course, he started out like running numbers in what was known as the East Liberty section of Pittsburgh. His dad worked for Bell Telephone, kind of one of your usual things. He was just kind of a rebellious youth from middle to lower middle working class family. They did get to have enough money to send him to the Catholic high school. Of course, I think a lot of you guys know better than this. I'm not a Catholic, but I've noticed all my friends that live in cities, they primarily, no matter their income, they primarily went to a Catholic high school of some kind. I think the church maybe makes it a little easier. Even if you don't have much money, I think they make it easy financially on the people who don't have as much money for their kids to go to Catholic school. You know, here's an interesting one. Nick the Blade, after he got, really didn't graduate from this central Catholic high school, but but he got out and he must have had, he must have had some, I don't know what was in his mind, but he went to the Pittsburgh Beauty Academy and he studied to be a hairdresser. He'll use that, uh, I guess, as a barber. I don't know. But this is back in the day where you either were a hairdresser, 
you went to hairdresser school or you're a barber and you went to barber college, which we had a downtown barber college. All of you of a certain age in a big city will remember the downtown barber college and you could go there and get your hair cut real cheap. I never did go. I, I went to the dental school and got a whole bunch of teeth worked on one time, but I never went to the barber college to get my hair cut. Kind of a strange skill that he learned for somebody who would become known as one of the real tough guys in the Northeast quarter of mafia families. And he was as tough as they come. And he was arrested 13 times for different things, but nobody ever convicted him before one of his last arrests and cases that were on him. And local prosecutors would say that's because witnesses would never testify against him. He earned the nickname Nick the Blade. That's an obvious question. Well, how did he get that nickname Nick the Blade? Well, he had a couple of different altercations. One of them, supposedly, there was a man checking out his girlfriend when he was standing in line at a movie theater, and, <laughs> and he pulled a knife and cut, sliced the man across the face. Another time, he was playing in a pickup basketball game, and they got in a fight with a guy, and he grabbed a knife up and stabbed the guy. He was arrested for numerous assaults in the 70s and 80s, and all kinds of different brawls at bars and stuff that he got into, uh, shootings in the downtown parking lot. He was arrested for attempted murder when he tried to run over a guy with his car. But each time, as I said before, victims would not cooperate. Of course, what he does is, you know, he was getting in fights with other people that, you know, they may not have been, they weren't mob guys or might not even been professional criminals, but they're young guys that operate in that kind of, that milieu, shall we say, in those bars, like to hang out in those bars and probably like to gamble and they drink a lot. And those guys historically don't, you don't even have to intimidate them into not going in and prosecuting you back in those days, particularly. Once an interview with a guy named Zach, who was a drug dealer, did time with Jess Wale or Nick the Blade. And he told them, says, he didn't mess around. If he had a problem with you, he'd tell you. And if it was serious, he'd just strap up. Now, you wouldn't even see him coming. Said later on, even at 70 years old, he was talking about getting dudes hit. That was, uh, you know, I like that term, strap up. I remember one time we were on a surveillance and of a fence who had, I don't know what the deal was. There's probably more to this guy than what we really knew about. He was probably a drug dealer, too. And we had one guy in a slick car sitting up close. And two guys all of a sudden came out. They had seen us, and we had our detective cars. This was before I was even in the intelligence unit. And two guys came out, and they started looking around the neighborhood. And we had this one guy sitting out. Actually, he was in a church parking lot, but where he could see that guy's house. And they pulled up to him and started questing him and real threatening, like, who are you? What are you doing here? And our man said, you know, I'm, I'm waiting here for the preacher. I'm supposed to clean this church. And they said, well, okay, all right. He said, we thought we were going to have to do something here. And, <laughs> and our guy said, well, he says, go ahead and strap up, man. They had reached down for his gun. And they said, I oh, no, no, that's okay. That's okay. And they went on. So I, I love that term strap up. You don't hear that much anymore, I don't imagine. I wonder what the origin of that is, strap up. By the 1960s, Nick the Blade was dealing heroin. He saw where the money is and was at the time. And this was for, according to the Pittsburgh police and the FBI, and they, there was a Pennsylvania Crime Commission at that time. You used to have these crime commissions that would document information about organized crime and publish books with their pictures and, and their background and their names and everything. And it, you couldn't get away with that today because they based a lot of stuff just on intelligence information. And maybe some other businessman or some other guy that was on the crime commission knew some bar owners and stuff that were kind of half in the life and would gather this information. But you couldn't do that today. He was a slippery dude, man. He was really hard to get. During that time, there was a guy called Big John LaRocca, who was the Mafia Don, and Michael Genovese was the head of the family during the 70s, and they created a real drug-friendly atmosphere. This became known as the Three Rivers Mob. There's Three Rivers Stadium, and there's Three Rivers Mob, I guess. This Michael Genovese actually encouraged narcotics dealing amongst his underlings because there's money in it. FBI records will, intelligence reports claim that Nick the Blade made his bones killing a man, a mob flunky in Pittsburgh named Alphonse Morano in 1967. Morano had unknowingly brought in an undercover IRS agent and introduced him into their underboss, Joseph Jojo Pecora. 
And he was Pittsburgh, pretty close to West Virginia down there, if you think about it, and the Hill Country. And he was in charge of all rackets down in West Virginia, and they had a lot of casinos. Everybody, I tell you what, out in the country, everybody likes to gamble, and everybody all over the United States likes to gamble, but they, they had some, a lot of small casinos down there in West Virginia. And law enforcement was, you know, rural law enforcement, they were pretty easy to, you know, their friends would be in there gambling, the L.A. might be in there gambling, but they weren't going to go after anything too big like that. The so string of raids occurred in uh, December 1967. Pecora was arrested, and this Alphonse Morano was arrested, and he had brought in this undercover agent that set all this up and arrested on interstate gambling charges. You know, whenever they, we once did a deal working on a, a guy that was taking some bets, and we really wanted to make a case on him because we thought we could turn him. And the FBI agent, we, we got him introduced. It was mainly our informant that got him in, but got this undercover agent introduced. And then the agent went over to Kansas and called back to this guy. So I could have an interstate bet to get a federal case on him. Guy never turned. Michael Genovese knew pretty quickly that Murano had introduced this undercover agent in, and he blamed him for it. And next thing, the next day, he's found dead in his trunk in an abandoned road in Westmoreland County. It was a classic mob rub about three times in the back of the head. You know, they get him in a car, get him in the right front, and somebody gets behind him and pop him in the back of the head. He didn't even see it coming, more than likely. Just while a or Nick the Blade was questioned for that, and an informant said that this was him, and, and that's how he made his bones. 1973, during the 70s, just before cocaine and everything got so big, heroin was still huge, and Nick the Blade had a Lebanese connection into the Middle East. He ended up getting arrested for part of this operation, bringing heroin in to Pittsburgh directly from Beirut. Now, you know, there is a Lebanese mafia. There, it's big in St. Louis. We didn't have much here in Kansas City, if any. We only had the La Cosa Nostra Sicilian mafia in Kansas City, but St. Louis has a big connection to Lebanese. You know, Jimmy Chagra down in El Paso area and a lot of drugs going down through there was a Lebanese connection. So uh, they had one in I ought to do a story. Anybody know much about the, any, any Lebanese crime families? I could probably do something on St. Louis. Uh, there was the Michaels and the Leisures, I think, were their name. They were into your normal kind of rackets, mainly labor union stuff, but stolen property and all your normal kind of racket. Ends up getting the case thrown out because it wasn't, the evidence wasn't there to get anybody convicted. This guy that's talked to this magazine uh, named Zach, he would say that they called him Chaz for some reason. I'm not sure why, but he called him Chaz. Says Chaz had a long run in the drug game. This dude, Zach, that we talked about before, told this Real Crime magazine. He said Chaz, and I don't know why they called him Chaz. Says Chaz had a long run in the drug game. He made a lot of money. And, and when he ended up going to the joint, he went up, ended up going in for 28 years. And that money really sustained him during that time. He was all about business, in the streets or in the prison. He was a serious mafioso and a drug kingpin. He was kind of like Teflon Don. He, I mean, what was it? Gotti said, he said, La Cosa Nostra today, La Cosa Nostra forever. I mean, these guys, they, they just want to live that life. That's their entire identity, and Nick the Blade was one of those. And he was known as really Pittsburgh's biggest narcotic trafficker in the 70s and 80s. He was also an enforcer for the crime family in Pittsburgh. He was a mafia lifer who followed the code of Omerta. He was a liaison between the local La Cosa Nostra family and the area's outlaw bikers. You know, many times the crime families will have some connection with the outlaw bikers to get certain things done. You can kind of farm out stuff to bikers, and, and they'll do stuff and keep you insulated from that. His bikers, you know, they had their own code of Omerta and their own internal disciplinary process. So if I were in the mob and I needed to get something done, by somebody that was not in the mob, that would be a rational, logical place to go. As he got on up in the 80s and 90s, and marijuana and cocaine became more popular and heroin kind of dropped off, and so he got into that. He was connected to the Pagan's Motorcycle Gang to help in distribution. He was still working for the La Roca Genovese La Cosa Nostra crime family on into western Pennsylvania. It just seemed like he could do whatever he wanted to do because if you think about it, they were asked one time, this John LaRocca was asked one time, he said, why, why did you keep somebody around like that? As, you know, he could cause you a lot of heat. And he said, well, he keeps the heap off of us. 
even though he must have been a made guy, but they figure, you know, as long as you're fake, you're focusing on him, you can do a lot of other stuff. Dealt with kilos. He was vicious. He was amoral. It wasn't about right and wrong. He just did whatever he wanted to do. The prosecutor that helped prosecute him in the 80s, assistant U.S. attorney, said, you know, he was as bad as he gets. He was the ultimate thug. He loved playing the role of the Mafo Capo being the Don. A claim during this time he made in excess of $1 million from his drug operation. The Internal Revenue Service uh, claims that. be like about $3 million today, I guess, or even more. At that point in time, he lived in a $1,200 a month penthouse apartment on the Bunker Hill Street in the Highland Park area of Pittsburgh. Always lived under an assumed name. They said he wore a different pair of Gucci shoes every day. He always dined at the best restaurants in Pittsburgh. He'd have these different girlfriends, and he'd buy them, spend all kinds of money on them. He always flew first class all over the world. He always drove Cadillacs and Jaguars, and he always, as like a lot of these do, he registers his and his mother's name. He was a big gambler. He lost a lot of money in Las Vegas. This all came out as court case for being the drug kingpin. They would claim that he controlled the majority of the cocaine and heroin markets in Pittsburgh all the way up until he finally went to the penitentiary. He also was involved in bookmaking, the traditional activities of bookmaking, loan sharking, extortion, ran a prostitution business clear back in New York City, I, apparently with the approval of the, some crime family or the, the commission, otherwise he wouldn't be doing it. And he was the kind of guy that would follow those kinds of rules. He spent a lot of time in New York. They testified that he dealt out of a bar called Swiss Vale. He was a big gambler, and even in prison. They would say that he played a lot of poker and he bet on all the games. Said not just a little bit. He would bet $500, $1,000 on every game on every Sunday during the football season. And he'd often win. He was a good handicapper playing poker. I mean, he was just, you know, a sick gambler, kind of like Gotti. I mean, this is like the uh, Pennsylvania Gotti, all this description that I'm finding out about him. He would shake people down for other mobsters uh, when they wanted somebody, something done. Like there was a policy kingpin, Harry Mattarella, and they needed to shake him down for some money there in Pennsylvania. It wasn't even him. It was a guy named Rauchy who wanted this done. They beat him like a redheaded stepchild with a baseball bat. This attack took place in a downtown Pittsburgh parking lot that Mattarella owned. Mattarella had refused to pay a monthly tribute to the mob and the Pittsburgh mob, and, and that's what cost him. Now, they did testify at that, but they only did like uh, just while they and a guy named Billy Porter did two years in jail over that, but that beat down let everybody know what would happen if you didn't pay the Pittsburgh family. Tell you what, there was an FBI agent named Roger Greenbank worked on the Pittsburgh mob during this time. He called Nick to Blade, a guy who was a crude and fearsome narcotic kingpin who had absolutely no redeeming qualities. He was six foot four, 250 pounds. I hadn't mentioned that before, but he was also a huge big guy. And he was nuts. I mean, you know, six foot four, 250 pound guy that is willing to kill you with a knife or with his fist or with a gun. You know, it's unbelievable. He's kind of, they said he was an animal too. They once had a surveillance photo. I'd like to have this surveillance photo. He was snorting cocaine off of one hand and pissing off the balcony of this high end, high rent apartment that he lived in or condo in Pittsburgh. They would call him the John Bellucci of the mafia with a severe, violent streak. That's a pretty good <laughs> description of John Bellucci of the Mafia with the violent streak. He actually got a little pop culture fame with, I mentioned before, he was a Pittsburgh connection from Goodfellas. He was supplying cocaine to Lucchese mob associates, Henry Hill and Jimmy the Gent Burke and Two-Gun Tommy DeSimone. If you remember, that was those were played by Ray Liotta, Robert De Niro, and Joe Pesci in the uh, Martin Scorsese movie. And Nicholas Pileggi was a scriptwriter. Goodfellas. This guy he was in prison with that was talking later on says that he loved the notoriety of the film brought him. When he was locked up and it came out, he reveled in the infamy, he said. He used to tell people all the time, I'm the Pittsburgh connection from the Goodfellas film. He was really proud of that little bit of fame. Made him feel like a star. And he always made it clear to everybody that he wasn't a snitch like Henry Hill. He hated rats. He hated rats, in which, you know, go figure that one. <laughs> now, Hill and Jimmy the Gent 
Lucchese Associates met Neck the Blade via a former prison cellmate of Henry Hill, a Pittsburgh Mafia. He was in a joint with a Pittsburgh Mafia associate named Paul Mezzi. Paul Mezzi worked under Nick the Blade moving coke and heroin and marijuana, and, and he's the one that hooked them up. Mezzi would eventually become a federal informant himself, and he was implicated in the Boston College men's basketball point shaving affair, if you remember that. That was a national scandal involving Boston College's their power forward, Rick Kuhn, if you're for you basketball fans, you remember that. I have some basic memory of that. I don't really remember much more about it. It's probably a whole other story. Probably ought to look into that because it's a pretty well known mob deal. Lefty Rosenthal was indicted in for paying off or trying to bribe college athletes, and I don't really know much more about that case. He was arrested for it. I don't remember if he was convicted. If he was convicted, nobody really mentions anything about that. That would be an interesting case to find out a little more about because he would have done that for Chicago at the time. These guys are always got people from the mob during these years out trying to see if there was any kind of athletes involved in these contests that there might be money on if they could bribe them. It's just it's a constant. The NCAA and NAACP. <laughs> that was a Freudian slip, I think. The NCAA or the uh, NFL or NBA, Major League Baseball, they're always having to monitor that kind of thing. They'll have these names of bars that, that players aren't supposed to go into. We had several in Kansas City at one time that were connected to the Savellas, and, and the players that came into Kansas City were given this list of bars that you're not supposed to go in that. I remember Carl Yastrzemski went into one one time, and I don't know if he, I'm not, I never did hear any more about it. I think he just went to it, but it came out that he went into it. That was kind of on the down low. That would never made the papers. Eventually, Nick the Blade, in 1985, will be indicted for all his drug dealing, and he's indicted with another member of the Pittsburgh Mafia, Johnny Three Fingers Leone, a pagan motorcycle gang boss named Daniel Zwiebel, Danny the Deacon, and a truck driver that worked for the Pittsburgh Press, uh, Ray Ingold, and who'd end up testifying against everybody. Now, Nick Blade got tipped off that he was under indictment, and when they were getting ready to take him in by an FBI secretary named Jacqueline Weimard, she told her boyfriend, who was a mobster named John Caraba, who told Nick Blade's guys, and he disappeared for a while. With this kind of brought his... Uh, high level way and, you know, snorting cocaine off his balcony and peeing off his balcony and getting in bar fights and everything kind of brought that all to a halt. And a fugitive for a while ended up on the U.S. Marshals' most wanted list. Purportedly, he fled with about $600,000 in cash and he went to Jamaica and was still doing drugs down there, running drugs out of Jamaica. And he was eventually arrested in July of 1986 what about a year or so later in Montego Bay, Jamaica? Somebody down there ratted him out, and the U.S. Marshal Service worked with the Jamaican police. I, I'm surprised that they helped on that, because, you know, he had $600,000. He'd be spreading money around like crazy. But anyhow, this Ingold, the guy that worked for the Pittsburgh Press, was one of the guys that was telling agents where he could be hidden. He must have been contacting people back in Pittsburgh. One thing they knew about him how they found him kind of interesting they knew he was a huge basketball fan and of course you always have money on all the games and got those basketball you can have that over under and all kinds of different bets on on basketball it's almost as popular as football maybe even more so in some circles to bet on there's more games football really is not that many games compared to basketball baseball never really got to be real popular to bet on doesn't seem to me like but basketball and football those are the two so there's only two satellite dishes on the whole island, and one was at Montego Bay Hotel. So one thing they knew, that he would go down there and watch football. I don't know exactly, or basketball, if they, I think they caught him down there when he was doing that. But they had to be told, this other guy told them that he was down in Jamaica, but he didn't know where. Flew him back to Pittsburgh, his last trip on a... Uh, First class, he flew back on the Learjet. Just a week into the trial, he just went ahead and pled guilty, and he got 45 years. That's what he's about 60 at the time, so that's basically a life sentence for him. At the time, the FBI and the U.S. attorney will believe that they have 
pretty much destroyed the mafia in western Pennsylvania. There's a U.S. attorney at the time made a statement the night of the uh, convictions. Everybody else ended up pleading guilty pretty quick after that. They said, we have successfully severed the head from the body of La Cosa Nostra in western Pennsylvania. You know, he was the biggest moneymaker for the family. He would be hard to replace. You know, a crime family is like any time you don't diversify and you've got one guy that's making a whole bunch of money for you, then, you know, when he's gone, then what do you do? you got to figure out other ways to make money. And, and he was doing everything, drugs, gambling, loan sharking, extortion, murders. He had been the guy without having the rank, shall we say, just a made guy for the Pittsburgh mob. Some of his peers were convicted of RICO and drug conspiracy by 1990. One of them will enter into the witness protection program. The other one dies in prison. Nick DeBlade is kept. He lived his life in prison. And, you know, a guy like that can thrive in prison. I guess he survived by giving everybody haircuts and, <laughs> and being a badass. And then he had plenty of money, too. His brother will claim that Nick DeBlade was not really the drug kingpin that FBI said he was. But was given a raw deal that he served more time than most murderers, and he never even killed anybody. Yeah, he said he stabbed a few people, but those were just neighborhood disputes. Finally, after 28 years, he's released from custody in 2014. He's prohibited from going back to Pittsburgh. This is because he'd made threats against law enforcement figures during the time of his conviction. Now, 28 years later, I don't, wouldn't worry too much about those threats. But So he went to Florida. And, of course, he already had connections <laughs> being in the drug business so back in those days. You had connections in Florida. 72 years old, and he still carried himself like he was a mafioso when he was young. He had a Rolls Royce at the halfway house when he first got there. And by the time he got out, park it right in front, said he bought it for a hundred grand in 1985. His sister had held on to it that whole time. You know, it's kind of interesting. A few years before I was left the police department, Worked a lot of different drug cases, and this guy's name was uh, Conrad Dooley or Dooley or something like that. And he was a kind of a big-time drug dealer. He had a real fancy Jaguar. He went to prison for quite a while, and he had stored it someplace. So he gets out, and the guy that's had it has sold it. Somehow he got directed to me because I was doing, I don't know, consumer protection kind of law. I was a lawyer by now, and this guy calls me and tells me he wants to sue this guy at this uh, storage place and because of his car disappeared while he was in prison. So I kind of perked up my ears, and I thought, I remember that name. I started calling around. He said, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's the same guy you're thinking of. We used to see him around driving this car around. He's kind of one of those real flamboyant drug dealers. Uh, the good ones don't get flamboyant. They drive just normal cars, and that's one reason this guy went down pretty quick. You know, I just called him back. And I said, you know, I can't do it. I'll, you'll have to get somebody else to do it. I was not going to get involved with that guy. I, I tell you what, even being a lawyer for those guys like that, badass street people. Doing white-collar crimes, one thing, or just a, your normal kind of uh, drug dealer is one thing, but a guy like, uh, like he was and connections he had, I wasn't going to do it. And I sure as hell wouldn't represent somebody like Nick the Blade. So later in his life, he wanted to sell his story to Hollywood, like a lot of people do. Policemen, gangsters, everybody's trying to sell their story to Hollywood right now. I'm still waiting on Brad Pitt to call me and tell him he wants to tell my life story in a movie. But I probably ought to write a book about it first. It's, on the whole, it's not really that interesting when you get into the, the reality of it. But I guess there had been some kind of a rapper that he'd been in the penitentiary with, and they told him, he said, you'll get millions for that story. And, you know, I hear that stuff all the time. Oh, you'll make a lot of money. Boy, just, you know, get a book and screenplay, and, you know, it's going to make you. But I'm going to tell you something. That ain't true. Even if you, and those of you who have been down this path that happen to be listening to this, you know that, first of all, if you do get a book, you're lucky to sell a few copies. If you happen to get a legitimate, well-known writer to put their name on it and rewrite it for you and, and put their name on it, then you're going to sell a decent amount of copies, but not life-changing money by any stretch of the imagination, just a little extra money. And then they may get a screenplay. They'll probably get a screenplay option, but that's just an option, and then it'll never get made. I don't know how many people. I know about four or five that have all been down that path, and the movies that still haven't been made, and they got really great stories. But in mind, he thinks he's going to go get a blockbuster movie deal. 
which is kind of interesting. He always followed the code of Omerta, but now all of a sudden he wants to tell his story like in The Goodfellows. He needs uh, Nicholas Pledgey to tell his story and Martin Scorsese to jump on it. He's bitching at the time. There's some quotes from him here. Uh, he said, they made a movie about that fucking rat. I need to make one about a real gangster like me. <laughs> they said in prison, that's one guy that they talked to after he uh, later in his life that was in the joint with him, said he would regale prisoners with stories about his Bob life for hours on end. He must have been a heck of a storyteller. He said he'd have prisoners rolling on the cell floors laughing at his stories. Even if it was a serious mob story about murder, or torture, and all that, it would still be funny and tragic at the same time. He was just one of those guys. He'd be great for the podcast, wouldn't he? <laughs> See, it was about all the crazy, ridiculous situations he got himself into during life. Drugs, women, money, booze, out violence. It was just a never-ending cacophony of chaos, organized and organized, and he was just off the hook all of his life. You know, that was a major victory for the feds taking down this guy. And they got him a lot of time. They never got his mob bosses for the narcotics trafficking, this Michael Genovese in particular. They did take down a few of the others around Nick DeBlade. You know, they ended up kind of taking them down for other things. Now it's just like Kansas City's a bunch of old men, and that's kind of a, a good thing, I think. By that point in time, they'd lost any connection they had to the labor unions. Gambling is, even in western Pennsylvania, you still got casinos, Indian casinos all over the place, got all kinds of gambling. They're legalizing sports gambling now. So all their profit centers, as we call those in the in the corporate world, that they've all taken away all their profit centers. I don't know what you do for money now. I guess do some bust-out schemes, loan sharking. But heck, the, for the smaller loan sharking, you got the payday lenders and the title lending companies. So I, I don't know what you do. Finally, about a year later, 73 years old, he was at a restaurant and bar, typical. He all of a sudden just fell over, dropped dead of a heart attack while he had a glass of Pinot Grigio. <laughs> Looking on the cell phone, one of the witnesses said he looked like he had his, was having a seizure and he ran and called 911. But by the time anybody got there, he was dead. Some people would say later on, you know, a tough guy like that, what's he doing drinking a Pinot Grigio wine? He should have a shot and a beer sitting in front of him like, I want you guys to buy me on Venmo. You know, I'm just kidding about that. I don't really drink, but, you know, sounds good. Sounds cool. They said he'd just sit around that bar and drink and talk to people and talk on his cell phone and still telling stories. And it was just a crazy, crazy life. And one of those tales that's bigger than life. I hope sometime, you know, nobody wrote a book about him that I know of. He didn't have that. So it's probably be unlikely they would do a movie about him unless somebody would go back. But you really need him to sit and give you direct quotes to do a movie by. They don't even probably don't even have a whole bunch of wiretap information and transcripts that you could get quotes from him to kind of get a feel for him. And and people close to him, it'd be, uh, you know, that's even harder to do. or Well, not harder than getting him to give you quotes because he's dead. But if he'd have given a good, solid interview like Lefty Rosenthal did for Pelleggi and some of these others have family members of Spilatro talk to Pelleggi, Henry Hill, you know, he sat and and let Pelleggi debrief him for hours and hours and hours. So that's about the only way you're ever going to get a movie and a book about your life at that level. So that's the story of Eugene Nick the Blade. Guess what? I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I looked it up. I've been criticized about some of my pronunciations, so I'm going to try to do a little better on that, which is rightfully so. He was a mobster's mobster. Well, folks, thank you for listening and all your nice comments on the Apple Podcast Reviews, plus your nice comments on my YouTube channel, where I often put up the uh, at least the Zoom interviews so you can see what my guests look like in real life. Also on our Facebook group, Gangland Wire Podcast. I see a lot of really good compliments on that. I've got some great people that help put up really good content. So if you want more mob information than you can shake a stick at, go to Gangland Wire Podcast Facebook page, or actually it's a group. Remember that if you support the podcast with some donations, you'll get an invite to my live Zoom call, where we'll share stories, answer questions, and in general, have a good time. 
Don't forget to buy me a cup of coffee or a shot and a beer on Venmo on your Venmo app, or you can go to Gangland Wire, my website, ganglandwire.com, and donate. I have a donate page, and, and each podcast that I put up has a pretty lengthy written blog piece about what the subject is, and at the bottom of that page, there's a way to donate. I have some fixed costs, and plus I'm raising some money for my next documentary, which is about the KC mob and the election fraud of 1946. I've already had to hire a film guy to do a couple of my interviews, and I have one more interview to film. Plus, I have an artist that I pay to do some illustrations for my movie, if you remember from Brothers Against Brothers or Gangland Wire. I use some illustrations in those, and by the way, you can rent those on Amazon for only $1.99 or two ninety nine if you want the HD version. And finally, I have my book, Leaving Vegas, the true story of how FBI wiretaps ended mob domination of Las Vegas casinos. Now, that title is a mouthful. But in that book, you're going to find copies of a lot of the transcripts of the actual wiretaps. And if you get the Kindle version, I took those audios that I got out of the court files and linked them to the book in the proper places. I have an explanation. And then the actual audio wiretap, which I think is kind of unusual. So you can go to Amazon and get that book and get it in the Kindle version. Gangland Wire supports the Veterans Administration and their programs that help veterans with PTSD. You can call their hotline at 1-800-873-8255 and push 1. Or go to their website, www.ptsd.va.gov. I hate saying that www. I left it out when I said something about Gangland Wire. You guys all know. I can leave that out. Anyhow, thanks a lot for listening, and listen up next week. I try to put out one a week. Music provided by our good friend and super fan from Portland, Oregon, Casey McBride. Thanks, Casey.